It is my immense pleasure to be formally introducing Padma Shri T. V. Mohandas Pai. In a career spanning over 35 years, he has served in various areas of finance, accounting, information system, technology, HR, education, corporate governance, social impact innovation, venture capital and startups, ecosystem, as well as philanthropy. Mohandas Pai, sir is currently the chairman of RN Capital, chairman of 314 Capital, chairman of Manipal Global Education, member of boards of Havels India. The governing council member of CAFRAL promoted by RBI, chairman of Regulatory and Financial Technology Committee and PMAC of SEBI and the founder of Akshay Patra Foundation. He was previously the board member and CFO of Infosys, the board member of SEBI, member of board of NEC of India, trustee of IFRS Foundation, chairman of FIKI Skills Committee and Higher Education Committee, and president of AIMA. Folks, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here at your 50th Golden Jubilee celebration. It's good to be here with you. My presentation will be on the post-COVID India. And uh, let me start now. I hope you can all listen to me. Uh, we have to understand that COVID-19 has impacted the entire world. Much more of the physical world is impacted than happened in the Great War of 2000. Uh, 1914 to 1919 and the Second World War from 1939 to 1945 because they were truly global events. Even the global financial crisis impacted a smaller part of the world than COVID-19. So this is global. This is all over and is not going away very soon. And it's not going away very soon because we don't have a cure. People don't know if a vaccine will come, when it will come. It may come next year. It may come by December. Everybody is trying on the world. So this is a truly global event and no part of the globe has been untouched. There are more than 150 countries which are impacted by COVID-19. Next, please. The health impact in India also has been very severe. We have more than about 25 lakhs of people affected by COVID. 50,000 people have died. Even though the numbers look very large, on a per million basis, it is very small. On a per million basis, only 40 per million have died, whereas the United States right now is about 500 per million. On a per million basis, uh, possibly we got uh, something like about uh, maybe 500, uh, 500 per million who have been impacted, whereas the US has got much large numbers. So India has handled it very well, but the fact remains that uh, it is spreading all across India, and we don't know when it's going to stop, primarily because we are a very, very large country. And we have seen many people go from the bigger cities to the smaller cities. And when they go, they carry it with them. So it's difficult. But I think the immunity of the Indian people is very high for various reasons. And we have seen that the death rate has come down below two. The total number of cured people has gone up to 71% of those who have been impacted. And all this is good news. We need to flatten the curve. We don't know when that will happen. Uh, maybe it's happened in Delhi. It's happening in Mumbai. It'll happen in uh, Chennai but it must happen in the other big cities and smaller cities too. Next. The economic impact has been extremely severe. The IMF has said the world will grow between 3 to 4% way back in February. Now, two months ago, the IMF said the world will degrow, have negative growth of 4.9%, and that are very optimistic. I personally believe out of the GDP of $87 trillion last year, the world will degrow by 8 to 10%. That means up to 8 to $10 trillion of GDP will disappear on the world. We see the United States come down by 9%, Germany by 12%, the UK come down by 11%, Japan by 6%, China has not come down so much. Indian figures are going to be released. So all around the world, uh, the last quarter has been terrible. Uh, Singapore has seen about 12% degrowth last quarter and is continuing the first two quarters of this year. And I think this is going to be a very, very big crisis. It's going to take maybe two to three years to come back to the GDP of the world as was on 1st January 2020. So we have to understand this extremely severe, extremely global, 
and it's going to take a long time before we come back. And the response by the governments and the central banks have been very, very severe. The central banks have flooded the market with liquidity. They have reduced the interest rates. The USA has reduced the Fed rate to 0.25%. India has come down to 4%. Japan has come down to negative. And Canada is down. Eurozone is down. UK is 0.1%. We have not seen such low interest rates ever in our history. Even the Second World War did not have such low interest rates. And this is very, very big. Because with such low interest rates and printing of money, you're going to see a flood of liquidity. And the liquidity goes outside the home countries to other countries. We'll see asset bubbles happening all around the world. So interest rates are going to remain low for the next two and a half, three years. The Federal Reserve of the United States has said they don't plan to raise interest rates before 2022. Never in history had they made a prediction so long away that they're not going to raise interest rates. So we are in for very interesting times. Next, please. This time is different. Every time some crisis happens is different, but this time is really different because it's more intense and sudden. The world fell off a cliff, literally, because you know when they announced the lockdown, everything came to a standstill. It happened at different times all around the world. And uh, you know you just fall off because everything shuts down and you see the impact and countries which are high uh, exposure to services saw a greater impact than countries which are lower exposure to services is more pervasive, is across many, many sectors. And before the COVID crisis itself, the global GDP was very fragile. That means growth has come down because of the trade crisis between the United States and China. And uh, this had lowered the growth rate. Deglobalization was in retreat. And when this happened, everything, I think, just blew up. So I think, you know, the global economies are more integrated today. 30% of the GDP of the world is impacted by exports and about 1.5 billion people travel around the world. So with the more integration, anything happening in one part of the world impacts other part of the world. And I think that is what is you're seeing today. So everybody's impacted, but this time is different because it has happened suddenly. Everybody had a curve, but this time it has been a steep fall. Next, please. And the COVID crisis exposed the world's over dependence on China. China made up 24% of the world's manufacturing. China is the largest importer in the world, largest exporter, largest foreign currency reserves, etc. The whole world depends on China for manufacture, for consumer goods, and the dependence was not good because the supply chain all went to China. And the world discovered they're so dependent on China. For example, 92% of some generic medicine in the United States comes from China. And half of, half of uh, the manufactured components that Japan needs comes from China. And China is the biggest buyer of commodities in the world. If China shuts up, everything will come down. And this war exposed to China has made countries realize and bring back manufacturing back home. Uh, in Germany, they passed a law saying that certain companies cannot be acquired by Chinese companies. Japan has passed a law that 450 in the companies are national champions and they're spending about two and a half billion dollars trying to incentivize companies to come back from China and manufacture in Japan or elsewhere. America has gone up to Huawei, is going up to Chinese companies like TikTok, etc. India has also taken steps to prevent the capital coming in and buying our companies. And we are seeing resistance to Chinese investment all across the world, even though some countries are opening up because they were desperate for money. But the fact remains that China's exposure to the world is very large and the world is trying to bring back. And that means there is deglobalization. Before COVID, we could book a flight, take a visa, go to another country. Now you cannot. They're putting up barriers. America is not giving H&B visas, is not giving other visas, etc. So we are seeing very clearly that uh, the fissures and the fault lines, the global economy are being seen and becoming extremely visible. Next, please. And this slide shows you that the global stimulus is $9 trillion. Now it must come to $12 trillion. The US has got one more trillion. Other countries have come up with much more. And it just shows that uh, so much money has been printed on an $87 trillion GDP. If uh, 10, 12, 15 trillion dollars of currency is printed, you can imagine the increase in money supply. And all countries are doing this. Japan gave $750 to every Japanese. Uh, in Germany, you have more than nine and a half million people who are being paid by the government to do job training. In the UK, nine million people are on. Uh, Money is given by the government in services, etc. 
And uh, in the United States, they're planning to come out with another stimulus. They already had a stimulus. They want another stimulus. They'll probably continue to have a couple of more stimuluses before the elections. So it is a global problem. And the world has responded by having stimuluses. And the one thing we need to understand, before COVID, out of the $36 trillion of government bonds in the OECD, $18 trillion was negative interest rates. Now that $36 trillion may go to $50 trillion, and about $30 trillion may be negative interest rates. So this is going to have a severe impact on people's savings, on pension funds, and global GDP in the future. Next. India has come with a 20 lakh uh, stimulus or 20 lakh, 8 and a half lakhs is by RBI, essentially giving liquidity measures. And we have seen the government come with a 12 lakh crore stimulus out of which two and a half crores is just uh, <coughs> government payments for people who are below the, the bottom of the pyramid, giving them free rations till uh, November, uh, giving them money in the bank, giving uh, free gas connections, etc. And this is not a good impact because a lot of people are poor and we don't want them to uh, not have food on the table. So I think the government has done that. They guaranteed 3 lakh crores of government loans for MSMEs. They're giving 1 lakh crore for FormGate, 2 lakh crore for Kisan Card, etc. The government uh, spending has essentially been to give guaranteed loans, improve liquidity so that people can check along. And of course, MSMEs are making large losses. Big companies are not making profit. Many of them are making losses, etc. And this will take time to recover. But flooding the market with liquidity, reducing interest rates, at least help companies survive. Of course, we're going to see more, more and more zombie companies. Zombie companies are companies that can just about pay interest on the loans if the interest rates are low, but uh, they'll not be able to pay back the principal. So the hit to the banks are going to come sometime later. So people say that the NPA of the banks will go up by 4% of the total loans. We don't know. We have to wait and see. But India has taken steps to have relief. And we hear that next month there could be stimulus too. We have to wait and see. The middle class and the lower middle class have not got any benefits. It just got to the bottom of the pyramid. And I think they also need some benefits. Next. One big industry which has been hit is crude oil. Crude oil was a $6 trillion industry. It came down to $4.5 trillion because of the fact that oil prices came down at $65, $70 a barrel. Now, because of this, uh, oil prices have come down even more. Before this, uh, the oil prices had crashed because China was locked up in February, March. The world was then open. And China locking up meant that the world was having excess oil of 30 million barrels a day. The world consumes 100 million barrels a day. Now, 30 million barrels was excess. So the prices came down. It was negative in the United States because of derivatives expiry. Uh, but, you know, this had a great impact on the budgets of oil company, oil countries like Saudi Arabia, Russia, etc. The Saudis budget, budget uh, balance is $85, but they're getting about $45, and they cut down production by 9 million barrels. So I think the world has now come to maybe 80, 89, 85 million barrels of oil a day. It's not come back to the old statement. It's much better than what was three months ago. But this year and the next year is going to be tough years for oil. So a $4.5 trillion economy has come down to maybe two, two and a half trillion dollars, and geopolitics and many countries are going to suffer. The Middle East is suffering lower oil revenues because consumer demand has come down. The US was the largest producer of oil at 13 and a half million barrels a day before this due to shale gas and shale oil. Uh, but now they also had to shut down three months ago. Now, of course, with $45 a barrel, they're all coming up. So I think the world is at a very delicate balance in the oil. And uh, most countries have seen blue skies, clean water, etc. So they don't want to go back to the time when there's been so much of pollution. But this could be the flashpoint for uh, fossil fuels to start declining over time and alternate energy to come up. So this could be the inflection point. This may have a positive impact on climate change. So we may benefit, but you know, we are going to be stressed because of the oil collapse. Next. This slide says it all. You see Zoom go up, all the airline companies have come down. International airline travel has come to a standstill. Very few flights are there. National travel has come to a standstill too. Very few flights are there. And even in travel international, you have to be in quarantine for 14 days. So not many people are traveling. So I think there is amount of stress. So the world may never be the same again. The biggest impact has been on tourism, restaurants, retail, 
hospitality, and travel. And this was a large part of the economy because tourism was the largest employer in the world. And that, I think, is really, really very severe. Next. Next, please. Yeah. The beneficiaries have been the global digital giants. Apple has benefited. Alphabet, which is Google, has benefited. Amazon has benefited. Apple has seen an increase in the Apple Store revenue. We've seen an increase in the services revenue. Alphabet has not seen an increase. Advertising has come down. Amazon has seen a 2x increase during a sale and 40% increase year on year. And Alpha, Amazon has seen a massive increase in its cloud business because everybody is going on to the cloud in a big way and consuming more data. So the big digital monopolies we are here, Apple, Google, Amazon, and uh, Amazon and Microsoft are going to be the prime beneficiaries. Next. And here in this figure, you can see how the valuation has gone up. The value of this uh, six companies has gone up by about $1.7 trillion. And they are the ones driving the stock market, seven companies. Even Netflix has gone up, Tesla has gone up. Uh, Elon Musk has become the fourth richest man in the world today. And uh, we have seen Amazon go up tremendously. I mean, it's incredible what has happened. The Fang Mang are the digital companies today are worth about seven and a half trillion dollars out of the $33 trillion of market capitalization of the United States. Next, please. Even in Indian tech, I'm not talking software service companies, I'm talking about startups. Before COVID, they've seen the increase in business for them. You can see the charts here. The yellow is the latest for the last year, and green was the year before that. On the right-hand side, you can see the slides for um, the businesses which are, uh, you know, uh, sunicons, which are going to be unicorns very soon. And I think they're all seeing huge growth because everybody's habits have changed. The biggest change have been people's habits have changed. For uh, consumables, they're going to e-commerce. For banking, they're doing e-banking. For health, they're doing tele telehealth. And for education, every day, uh, many, many children in urban areas are getting up in the morning, watching up, breakfast, put on the uniform, sit in front of the laptop, do their courses get up at 4 o'clock and go back and work right at home. I mean, they're not stepping out. I think only now they're trying to go out, but it's very difficult. And we have seen also that Hotflix and Netflix are shot up because of entertainment. Everybody has got used to consuming more data, consuming more, uh, more in uh, digital. And, and in future too, digital business is going to be the key. Travel is going to come down. Hospitality is going to come down. Tourism is going to come down for the next two and a half, three years. Because in business, we have found that there's no need to travel too much. As today, we are all there together, but we are there together using technology. We are not physically present. So tomorrow, we could have a technology with holograms. We could all be present with the holograms in the big hall, wherever you are. And from there, we could all be talking to each other, though we'll be only avatars of ourselves. But this technology innovation has changed human habits. So if you don't have a digital front to your business, or your profession, you're going to be in deep trouble because all clients are going to come to you to the digital technologies. Next. So here also on another slide, you can see on the green, what kind of businesses, groceries, uh, delivery, et cetera, has gone up. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the physical businesses by like mobility, uh, like hotel technologies, mobile, uh, mobile events are going down. Food delivery is going down. So some businesses have gone up tremendously, some businesses come down, and it's been a shock to the entire system. Next. So what is the new normal in investment? New normal in investment is availability of secondary is going to go up, consolidation financial services, manufacturing will grow using technology, things are going to get automated, robotics are going to take off in a big way because human beings can't work together for some time. And new age businesses have seen clear way to profitability. All the new age businesses are changing the business models and trying to become more viable because they feel that they can't have the old model where they go on wasting money. And we are seeing that uh, branded alternatives are coming up. Uh, we are seeing much of distressed assets coming up and being sold at low prices. And the sectors with good uh, risk cushion who have got cash in the balance sheet like the IT service companies are doing reasonably well. So now every industry will want to keep cash in the balance sheet will have better risk management because they found that you don't have enough liquidity, you're going to die. 
even though you have great assets, liquidity is the key to success in future. That means you need to have savings, you need to have a bank balance, you need to have great lines to do well in future. Next, please. We're seeing a decline in uh, cash uh, before COVID itself. Uh, digital payments overlooked uh, or took cash from the ATMs in India. That's good news. And if you look at the survey, more and more people are saying they're going to use less cash. They're going to be more digital. You've seen the UPI data last month, which has just taken off. And that, I think, is very, very interesting. Next. And this is interesting. In March, uh, Geo had 11.3 GB of data per user. And we had uh, Airtel with 14.5. Now in June, Geo has gone up to 14 GB per person per month, and Airtel has gone up to 17. This is amazing. That's all happening because people are spending more time on the mobile, more time on their screen, and uh, they're seeing more movies. What kind of movies they see, I don't know. You may know better, but certainly seeing more and more movies, more and more entertainment. They're all getting locked up because they're not spending time going outside or traveling. I'm sure all of you are glued to your screens. People are working harder. People are working from home. 95% of the IT industry in Bangalore of 20 lakh people are working from home. The entire IT industry of 45 lakh people, 90% went to work from home across India in 15 days. It's incredible what has happened. They got security clearances. They put up the equipment. They were able to uh, put in software and they're able to do that remarkably. Now, most of them want to come back. I think after this, only 30, 35% of people will work from home by rotation. I think because young people don't want to work from home, they don't stay in big houses where there's capacity. And the people who are married with young children also don't want to work from home because you know they're all cooped up together. It's only senior people like me who have bigger houses uh, who want to stay at home and who don't want to travel uh, because traveling is a pain. They don't want to be stuck in traffic. So funnily enough, in most uh, companies, the senior people want to work from home. Earlier, they didn't want to work from home because they said we have to supervise. Now they're feeling very comfortable. They don't have to travel. They don't have to expose themselves. And the junior people, uh, you know, junior people are very careful. Next. Education has really taken off and education has got more than one and a half billion dollars of commitment. Next, please. The new normal in education, Baiju. Baiju has got three and a half million subscribers. He's got 12 million people who came on in April. And uh, Baiju is now raising $300, $400 million at $10.5 billion. And his valuation has gone up, his revenues have gone up. And suddenly we see this huge rush in Vedantu, Una Academy, etc. Many of these companies, including White Heart Junior, are selling at huge prices because every kid is going in for digital. How long it lasts, we don't know. When classes come back, of course, this will go down. But life in future in education will be offline, online. Everything is not going to be offline. Everything is not going to be online. It's going to be somewhere in between. For colleges, it could be 40% online. And for schools, it may be 20%. But teachers have to be retrained. Pedagogy has to change. And people have to get used to looking at the devices. And education has been deeply impacted and will never be the same. Even the AICT has said that the content in online can go up to 40%. They're trying to revise the regulations. Right now, they allow 20%. Next, please. Even in health tech, a new national health stack has come. Prime Minister Modi announced it on Independence Day and the health stack, it will have different layers, a layer for JAM, that is uh, Jandan, uh, Aadhaar and Mobile uh, for financial transactions and it will have a layer for getting all your records. That means the health stack issued by the government like UIDAI can become a major, major app where maybe 500 million, 600 million can come on. It will be the largest such app in the world and the work has already been there and the app has been released. So we're seeing great innovation and development uh, being showcased during the COVID crisis. Today, the regulations have changed to allow uh, e-medicine and I think many people are able to use this. Next. Well, and you can see the innovation here. One of the challenges people had was the lack of uh, ICU beds. Now with a company like Dozy, which has come with the innovative product, which is like a blanket with uh, uh, devices, sensitive devices, IoT devices. Uh, you just put it under your bed and you lie on it and you monitor some 12, 13 critical parameters, including your sleep, including your blood pressure, including your heartbeat, etc. just by taking all your vitals. 
and uh, this is doing away with the need for a large number of ICUs. So any bed anywhere can become an ICU. The data goes on to the mobile, which is uh, linked to your uh, uh, doctor. So the doctor can monitor you from a remote location. And this is a very great innovation that has come up. They already sold 40,000 devices. Next. Agriculture is suddenly seeing a lot of health tech, I mean, a lot of uh, you know, technology come in. We have, um, I think, you know, we have the largest quantum of fruits and vegetables in the world, second largest, in fact, 140 million hectares. So we are going to see the role of agri tech. 600 agri techs are there in India, and we're going to see increase in productivity, better selling, connecting farmers to market. The government also has come out with policies. This is the rise, direct result of COVID uh, impacting agriculture. And we all thought agriculture will be the last one to be impacted by technology, but we've seen a big impact. Next. There's a company, uh, there's a company here called Ibono, which is an agri-tech company. You can see here, they put sensors into the ground to find the soil condition, then suggest when to plant the seed, what to do, how to cure the soil to make sure it has nutrients. Then after they give you the seedlings, they monitor the growth of the seedlings using drones. Then they look at the weather patterns and tell you when to water, what to do, when to put in growth nutrients, etc. Then you are able to cut the crop and deliver to the market the same day and get the payment the next day. The entire thing is done by an app and it's a beautiful uh, company. And I think the revenues have gone up 3x. It's still a small company. It just shows, even in a traditional area like agriculture, great innovation is taking place. Next. The new normal grocery, you can see the slides here. The first was where grocery was before COVID, suddenly shot up 3x, 4x in COVID. Now it's going to take a break and stabilize and then it's going to shoot up again. Because the next time it shoots up, it shows the result of habits being changed. The shoot up during COVID is because of COVID, then the habits change. And you can see all the winners on the right hand side. Many companies have seen the revenues grow up 2x, 3x. On top of that, Geo has come in. And Geo is already getting 400,000 orders per day. And they got 400 million uh, people on their app. I think they're going to be a big competitor to Amazon, uh, Walmart, etc. Because India is the place where there's going to be the severest competition. In the United States, Amazon is the leader, no competition. In uh, China, you got uh, JD.com and you got Alibaba. And I think Alibaba is leading by far. But I think India is the battleground for digital domination between all the biggies in the world. Next. Now, of course, in financial services, India stack has been the big, big innovator. The India stack is a consent layer, cashless layer, uh, is a presenceless layer, and a faceless layer, and paperless layer. And here you have got Aadhaar, 1.2 billion people on Aadhaar, UPI, 1.6 billion transactions per month. And then uh, you've got uh, you know, EKYC, digital locker, personal data store, etc. This has been designed by volunteers in Bangalore is a public good, not owned by any private company, but the cost is very, very low. And this has enabled deeper digital transactions all across India. So India is a leader in digital transaction because of the India stack in financial services. Next, please. And India has to benefited tremendously. Aragya Setu has now got 150 million users. They're the fastest to reach 50 million downloads in 11 days. And I think, you know, we are not seeing 13 days. We are not seeing anything like this because before that, 50 million was a Pokemon in 19 days. Now in just 13 days, this has gone to 50 million. Now is that 150 million that allows you to look at people who are there next to you, possibly have COVID and is an app which is being downloaded by 150 million users. It just shows how digital has taken off in India. Next. And the government has used digital technologies to reach out to people, direct benefit transfer, 420, 42 crore benefits get money, 85, 90, I mean, 85, 90 million, nine crore women uh, are getting money, are getting gas cylinders, women gender holders, that is 200 million women accounts are getting money, PM Kisan, nine and a half crore Kisans have got money because government just transferred the money. The prime minister came down near Karnataka, announced the money is going to be transferred, next day it was done. No way in the world it happens on this scale like this. So I think the vulnerable sections of people have benefited by using the jam technology and government is able to reach money to them. And this has tremendously changed government delivery. And this is what has made tech enabled governance just take off. Next. <laughs> but the startup ecosystem will create a $10 trillion economy 2030. The old slide, 
I believe it will happen by 2031. Next. See this slide. 7.75 billion people on the planet in January, 5.2 billion have a mobile phone, 4.5 billion are on the internet, 3.8 billion social media. By now, I think these figures have increased. It just shows that most people are on digital already. Next. And India also has benefited 1.38 billion people, 1.06 billion people have a mobile connection, 687 million people are on the internet. If somebody tells you India ranks 35, 36 on digital exposure in the world, don't believe all that because you know no country has got 687 million people on the internet except for China, which has got close to 900 million. Next. So India's startup ecosystem is going to change India, the third largest in the world. It's got more than 40,000 startups, $160 billion of value has been created. Next. Is $60 billion of money has come in since 2014. Sadly, only 10% is Indian. About 10 billion has come in from Japan because of SoftBank and others. About 8, 9 billion has come in from China. And last year, the startup industry raised $14.5 billion. And before that, $13.78 billion. So I think there's been a tremendous rush, but China invests 65 billion and America invests 135 billion. It's still small, but India is the third largest ecosystem in the world. Next. And this is interesting. The new flywheel is ramping up. Exports last year reached 150 billion, and the total industry was about 200 billion. Four and a half million people are employed. Here is some data for you. The United States has 6 million people in software. 1 million are Indians. Out of 4.5 million people, 2 million work for American companies. Out of 8 million working for American companies, 3 million are Indians. 25% of Silicon Valley founders are Indian. 35% cybersecurity are Indians. And uh, of the top 10 software service companies by market value, uh, five are Indian, top five, three are Indian. Of the two million employees in the top 10, 1.5 million are Indians. We believe by 2025, we'll have 100,000 startups creating $500 billion of value. There are many, many startups in Mangalore, Udupi too. I'm very happy. And we'll have 100 unicorns. Right now, we have about 39 unicorns. Next. So India has 39 unicorns. We created $100 billion of value. By 2025, there'll be 100 unicorns. Uh, we gave the first check to Baiju seven years ago. We gave, nine, we gave $9 million at $20 million pre. Now, Baiju is worth $10, $10 billion. We have a small stake. The stake has come down, but nevertheless, Licious is our company. Jupiter is our company. Dark Money Box is our company. The many companies which are called Sunicons which will become unicorns very soon. So the most exciting part of growth in India is in private markets and startups. Next. There are many active venture capital investors in India. The list is here. Next. Corporate investors also increasing confidence, but we need more money from India. More corporates have to invest. And I hope some uh, people in Mangalore will also start investing in startups. Next. India's long-term growth, growth story is still impact. This year, we could have a minus 5% growth. Our GDP of 204 lakh crores could come down by 30 lakh crores because we are supposed to grow by 10%, 20 lakh crores, but we'll degrow by 5%. So the swing from what is expected to what will happen is about 30 lakh crores. That is very, very large. That means you know it'll take us another one year to come back to the GDP that we were at the beginning of this financial year. But nevertheless, our long-term growth story is still intact because our debt, OC debt to GDP is low, our trade deficit is low, and we have a young population, and uh, we have crude prices are coming down, and that means uh, the economic condition will be quite strong. Next. So let me just uh, you know, stop here and talk to you about what will happen in the profession. You know, you are all in professional services. You do auditing, you do auditing, uh, you do auditing, you do taxation work, you do uh, consulting, you do accounting services, and you do advisory services or consult, consulting, etc. And in all of them, I think people are going to use digital. So I would urge all of you to adopt digital, create digital systems in your own offices so you can respond, use more of technology, use more of video conferencing, create digital documents because the tax authorities audit, everything is gone digital. Even when uh, the when lockdown was there, uh, annual general meetings are all, all digitally for the first time and board meetings were digitally. So everything has gone digital and that will continue after this. Even tax assessments are going digital now. Prime Minister has announced that they be faceless assessments. So with the digital world, you have to be digital. And when you are digital, distance becomes a casualty. 
That means you can look at the entire world to do work. My former colleague from uh, Infosys, Sudhir Pai, he told me that he has got a small unit uh, near Manipal, which is doing uh, tax work for the United States. I'm sure if you all connect with the uh, people whom you know in the United States, other places, you could start doing work in Mangalore and build up big teams because in Mangalore, you have Mangalore, Shimoga, Udupi, you have very good talent and you could become the back office of the world in accounting, in taxation, in uh, financial reporting, etc. Because I think there's great scope. For that, there are three things that you have to do. One, you have to create products that use the latest technology to be tech savvy. Second, you must learn how to market so that you can able to get work. And third, you must get people to work for you and train them up. And I'm sure when you have young people, they're already digital ready. And if you're able to do all that, I'm sure you'll do, you'll do very well. So this will play to your strength. Because you know, if you have a young uh, cadre of people, you have young chartered accountants, you have people who are tech savvy, you are smart people, and you know how to operate the system, you will all do very, very well. So I want to stop here and say, I wish you all the best. And uh, I do hope that you'll do well. And hopefully many of us will meet uh, for your centenary celebration 50 years from now. The last 50 years have been good, but the next 10 years are going to be even better in the last 50 years. And I'm sure all of you are going to do well. Wish you all the best. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So in the time uh, we listen to the people, sir, uh, or we get the question answers, uh, sir, I'm Dayanima Sharma, the Central Council yeah. member. And uh, fortunately, the youngest from the uh, southern part of India and the second youngest in the country as such. And uh, really delighted to see the kind of presentation you have made. It's really eye-opener. It was like, a, you know, uh, cover uh, that, that uh, fastest 100 news uh, channel. If you are just changing the news challenge one after another, we were able to listen to all the statistical information which was there from the globe. And the most important part is uh, you have not missed out uh, to showcase where our country is moving towards. The person who is advocating my nation as one of the, I am the proudest citizen of this country, which is the youngest country in the world. And uh, the kind of energy you have given, it is like accelerated to a different level altogether. Sir, what I can say, when you talked about agriculture, when it is transforming, or rather I'll put it reverse way, Sir, health is transformed. Undoubtedly, the hospitals and the way the treatment is going is changed. Manufacturing is changing. Uh, technology is the main boon. Education, which we never thought is going to change to a level where you have shown the kind of investment which is coming in. And the most important part, I think, which uh, the Indian economy depends upon the agriculture part. The way you have actually showcased that if the agriculture is changing, I think our profession requires a very quick introspection with regards to the adoption of technology, which is one of the most important part. And the best part in this country is, sir, I can really proudly say we are a self-dependent country. We have so much to consume ourselves that we need not think about exporting anything out. And today you are able to cater to the national request. I think national demand itself is so, so, so much that you know today the auto rickshaw driver is also keen on educating his children to the best level. And we have seen so many people who have come out in different industries, different exposures, the kind of you know uh, upbringing they have come through. Sir, three things you have covered in our profession, sir. The fourth thing which I request you to please put it very loud and clear before our members is, it is time where we need to collaborate together and make larger firms. Unfortunately, we are 70% of our practice units are, uh, you know, sole proprietary concerns. And this is not going to be the answer for our profession. If we have to grow in this profession, we have to make a large collaborative effort to come together and make things in a manner where people look at you. Very rightly said, sir, the best talent is lying in Udupi or might be Shimoga or even in Mangalore for that matter. So many people have migrated from their hometown, from their parents. And today technology has proved that you can go back and be with your parents, be with your family and still be around the world. You can be a global person sitting in any corner of the city or a town or a village. Because fortunately, this country, rightly said, sir, again, from 2013-14, which was 150th position in data usage, today we are world's number one, which is not a small number, sir. 
hats off to this government in last seven days, seven years, the kind of contribution they have made, the kind of push they have done, the technological moves they forcefully or directly or indirectly made, adopted, like whether it is Aadhaar card, whether it is PAN card, whether it is, you know, Aarabhya Setu, any example you take, sir, in seven years, I think we have reached a total, total different uh, landscape. If we just look at, at the top level, top of the tone, if we are there, I think we are world's number one country in many adoptions. There is no, no second thought. I am really proud to be an Indian. I feel so good that, you know, I'm coming from a generation which, is, which has seen a past, which is my father who's been a council member and I'm continuing to be there. Trust me, I'm, I'm so excited to listen to your speech that, you know, there's so much, so much we all can do. And we are only a handful of 3 lakh chartered accountants in this country of 150 crores. I think we are talking about the second largest accounting uh, association or accounting body globally and we are envisaging to be world's number one. But I think the adoption, uh, learning, I think we need to unlearn certain things and relearn certain things and make ourselves available. And the best part, sir, I think experience of seniors and speed of youngsters, if this get collaborated together, I think our profession is going to go on a total different zone. And I'm pretty confident in 70 years, we have adopted all the laws and technology across the board. We were the only institute which has adopted GST and made GST successful. Successful, not only GST, but all the different laws. Sir, your inputs always have been a huge, huge value. And all chartered accountants look up you, look up at you, you know, to listen from you and take certain things. I think your one message will make a whole lot of difference where we need to think about collaborating and making it big, sir. Now it is not the time where we can be individuals and work. That was the time. But this is the time where we need to make things happen. And I think your message has been loud and clear to all the people. Fantastic coverage, sir. I am really privileged to see you either virtually. I met you long back in uh, Shimoga, on, uh, uh, Mangalore only. And uh, now again in Mangalore on the screen though, it's a real, indeed a pleasure. I'm fortunate to be the program director of uh, Mangalore branch, uh, you know, Golden Jubilee celebration. And opening batsmen like you, you know, uh, Dhoni will never be forgotten. And your contribution to this profession is always on a continuous basis, a motivation to many of us when we look at you. Might be we are seeing you from distance all the time, but your inspiration and your, uh, you know, contribution to this nation has given us lot and lot and lot. And we assure you one thing, I think on behalf of Mangalore, Urpi, Shimoga, that, you know, we all will stand very strong and ensure that, you know, whatever the dreams you have shown us, we start working on it. And uh, you. your Thank support, you. yes, your support will always be an important factor for all of us. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Uh, we'll just check it out if we have any questions. I don't think anyone should have questions. Uh, but uh, amazing it was. Thank you very much. Really indeed a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir, one more thing is basically this adoption of technology is making certain difficulties. But yes, I think trying is the best thing we should uh, continue to do. And uh, apology for a small initial, uh, you know, hiccup which was there. So immediately I told them to shift that uh, co make me as a co-host. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. you are audible now. Thank you. Yeah, you take over, man. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for summing up the session very beautifully. And uh, we have to indeed thank uh, CATV Mohandas Spicer because he's been a mentor for all the startups. He's been a role model for all the CA fraternity. And he's been like a guiding force for the youngsters, of course. And he's loved by the entire business community. So we are indeed fortunate to listen to you. And we will surely incorporate all the words and all the avenues that you have spoken about in your message. And we will take, take it up in the right spirits by all the CA fraternity. Thank you once again, sir, for the wonderful message. Uh, we had a question by uh, CA Giridhar Kamath, sir. What is your view about uh, vocal to local uh, in this COVID uh, situation? So if you could answer about this particular uh, question of uh, one of our CAs, uh, T. Mohandas Pai, sir, over to you to answer the query. Uh, 
there's a slogan given to us by a prime minister after what uh, happened in China, because the prime minister understood that uh, deglobalization is going to be the norm. The world is moving away from China. And there's a great opportunity for us to create local industries. So we have to be vocal for local. And let me give some data. Over the last 10 years, uh, India had a trade deficit of $500 billion with China. China exports uh, last year about $70 billion. And we had a trade deficit of $55 billion. China is a mercantilist economy. It subsidizes its exports, subsidizes manufacturing. And we have a lot of traders who go import and many people prefer to import rather than make it here. So that's why the prime minister came out clearly, uh, vocal for local, just to say that we need to manufacture all this here out of about 65, 70 billion dollars of imports from China, 55 billion dollars have been identified, which can be made here, which are being made here because China was cheaper and they subsidized. Our traders went out and got it. And China, of course, has scale. So I think there's a very good slogan. Uh, we have to be vocal about local, primarily because we have to buy India. We have to support our Indian industry. We have to create more jobs in this country. And we should not export jobs. You can see the president of the United States putting up barriers for H-1B visas, not allowing people saying you want jobs for Americans. That's a new trend. Uh, because, you know, the globalization has helped China grow up from maybe $2, to $2, to $2, to $2 trillion to $15.5 trillion. Globalization benefited China the most. All other countries have suffered. Of course, they got some cheap goods coming from China, and that helped them. But nevertheless, you know, in many parts of the world, there's been high unemployment. So I think this tendency by uh, Prime Minister is very good. I hope all of you will uh, take it up too and do your bit. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what is your view about the agri policy which was announced recently? So the recent agricultural policy that was announced about that, your views and think... opinions. The most important thing about agriculture policy is the farmers have got the freedom to sell where they want. Earlier, going back to the time uh, after independence, farmers were forced to come to the mandis because the government thought coming to the mandis they can control uh, the farmer's sale and make sure they get the price. But the mandis have become cesspools of corruption. There are many people who gang up to deprive the farmer of the right price for his product, and we've seen this. So the farmer are free to sell anywhere. They get data on their cell phone about the prices in different markets, and they can uh, sell to agri tech they can sell to the direct consumer, the farmer will get a better price. And today we have 43% of population dependent upon 15% of GDP which is growing at 3%, that is agriculture. That means 43% of people depend only on 15% of GDP. 57% of people depend on 85% of GDP. So people in industry and service are doing much better. Income for farmers are low. And farmers cannot really come up uh, in... Uh, uh, come up in uh, life unless they're able to do better. There are too many people in farming. And so by uh, allowing the farmers to sell directly, they will get more money. And if you look at China, uh, how they grew, the first thing the Chinese did was to empower the farmers to grow whatever they want and sell. So China's food production went up 3x in about 15 years. And the farmers developed surpluses. The farmer plowed the money back into village and cottage industries. And that created the initial impetus for industrialization. Then they opened up the, uh, the, the coastal areas, faces arts, money came in, they used cheap labor, and that surplus are used to develop infrastructure, high quality education, high tech industry, et cetera. India has not been able to do that because it suppressed the farmers. And if more money goes to farmers, it will help. And this is one big thing. And Karnataka has gone one step further. Karnataka has amended the law to allow the farmers to sell the land to whom they want. Earlier, farmers could not sell. You and I could not buy agricultural land because they said it's got to be an agriculturist. We got enough land, second largest arable land in the world, second largest irrigated land in the world, but our productivity is half of the world's average. So what we need is more productivity. We got enough land. Nobody needs to be scared. So I think now farmers are free to sell and uh, there are many agri techs who connect farmers to income. So I think all these policies are empowering farmers. And if farmers get more money, the economic growth will happen because they will consume most of what they get. So, good evening, sir. I am uh, CSS Naik, chairman of the Mangalore branch. Uh, sir, what is the uh, impact of COVID on banking sector? Because RBI itself, they have projected the NPA percentage next year, it will rise to more than 12%. It is a matter of concern, no, sir. How it will impact the economy, sir? Well, I think uh, today, uh, economic growth has come down, consumption has come down, so people are making losses. And the only way for them to stay in business is to have greater liquidity. 
And obviously, when you have greater liquidity, it means that the banks have to give money. That's why government is coming with the 3 lakh crore guaranteed loan. And even if the NPS go up to from 8% right now to 12%, 4% more, uh, I mean, banks can afford it. See, the total lending in the banking system is 103 lakh crores. That means NPS going up by 4% is about 4 lakh crores. Even if the bad debts go up by 4 lakh crores the next two years, this year and the next year, it means that they have to write it off. And banks are providing 2 lakh 70 thousand crores in provisions every year. Of course, they require more capital. Uh, many of the profitable banks have to provide for it. So it's a question of pricing. So I don't think we should be deeply concerned about that, even though RBI says, and the banks should maintain liquidity. Banks should not underprice because today for most people, what is important is liquidity and ability to borrow rather than the price you pay. In the informal market, you pay 15%, 18%, 20%, and a bank which charges 9%, 10%, if they charge you 12%, you don't mind paying. And the extra two, 3% can go to pull the bad debts and write it off. Because banking is a pooling business where uh, you charge something to risk payment to everybody and you take care of the bad debts by doing that. So the banking system has become big enough. I'm not unduly worried because I think most of the banks are well capitalized. Their earlier NPS have come down. And certainly, yes, the matter of stress. But I think, you know, if they're able to give credit and maintain liquidity, I think it will be very good for the economy. They may take a hit. Yes, and we have to solve the problem, but there's no other option. So I don't think you should get worried. Sir, uh, this under Atma Nirbhar Bharat, 20 lakhs crores package has been announced by our PM. So now, what are the new avenues for chartered accountants under this Atma Nirbhar Bharat? Because a lot of policy matters have also been changed. What uh, benefits we chartered accountants can take, especially new uh, chartered accountants who have just passed out? Uh, what, what will be the opportunity for them, sir, under this Atma Nirbhar Bharat scheme? You see, Atma Nirbhar Bharat is a slogan under which a set of policies will come to incentivize local production, local consumption of services. Now, you are in the service industry. You are providing accounting, auditing, taxation service to your clients. Taxation has become largely technology driven. The tax preparation work is coming down. The appeals are also going to come down because disputes will come down with better technology. Auditing is becoming automated. So you have to learn automated audit techniques where you use audit tools. You have to learn how to use ERP system for accounting. And uh, you have to make sure that you understand cash flow forecasting, etc. The biggest growth for all of you will come in business advisory. Sir, uh, this uh, Indian ladies, they have flair for and love for this yellow metal. Now gold prices have skyrocketed. So now whether this will still go up or come down, that is a matter of concern for Indian ladies. What is your opinion, sir? Well, I don't want to speculate. Uh, I read the same media that you do and media says it will go up for some more time. It's already was just 56,000 per 10 grams, I think. It's come down to 51, 52. But I think India has about nearly $2 trillion of gold. $2 trillion of gold. The gold value is more than the stock market valuation. And uh, India has about 30,000 tons of gold, out of which 25,000 tons could be in households. So I think, uh, you know, if you look at gold prices, gold prices go up during a crisis, stabilize and don't move at all, then again take a spike uh, in a longer time than currency. Even Indian currency will, will, will fall down, uh, remain constant, fall down again in the step function. Even gold is a step function. And I think gold has had a tremendous run up. And people are buying gold because there's too much of currency getting printed. They think inflation will come. I don't think inflation will come. So I think it's uh, something that you have to look at and uh, see what are the alternatives for you. Uh, buying gold at this point of time at this high price is something that you have to seek professional advice from. But uh, if you've got uh, if the gold price is extremely high and you're sitting on very low value, uh, people must consider whether they have to sell that and uh, buy some other asset which can go up. For example, many people are saying that if the gold is 56, 57,000, sell gold and buy some good stocks because the next five, seven years, growth will come back, stocks will go faster, stocks are very down. So you must remember in the bull market, you must take your profits. In the bear market, you must buy. Right now, gold is in the bull market. I'm not giving you advice. I'm just stating what other people said. You have to take your own advice and decide for yourself. 
sir uh, this uh, uh, investment during falling interest trend many people they are concerned about the interest rates are falling so that's why more than 54 percent retail investors are in stock market is it not a matter of concern for them even stock market see economy is falling sir but economy is not doing one still sh share market is skyrocketing what's the uh, uh, team behind this well you must remember that markets discount the future right markets don't reflect current reality markets always discount the future markets are believing that uh, things will go up banking stocks are down technology stocks are up and the thing that uh, business for technology is going to be higher so markets are seeing the inflow of a lot of young people chartered accountants professionals bankers etc uh, who are coming and doing day trading they think they can make more money by day trading and making little bit of profits well many of them are doing well not many are doing very well many of them taking risk many of them may lose their shirt as inevitable but uh, that's the nature of the beast so i would uh, just advise them that even if you're doing trading or doing something else don't expose yourself to great risk there are great hedging techniques please hedge your risk so that you take limited risk and in within the limited risk and the capacity of a capital if you're able to do well that's fine that's great but uh, don't take oversized risk don't keep open positions too much because the market moves either way you'll be wiped out and that will not be good for you so oh, thank you very much uh, tvm sir uh, you are uh, most beloved amongst our all the chartered accountants mangalore branch oh our gratitude to you for always sir we remain uh, uh, in our memories all your uh, valuable words and tips given and uh, there is a saying to be inspired is great and to inspire is incredible you are incredible sir so we will follow the full steps of uh, 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 that great and uh, stalwarts uh, tall chartered accountant leaders like you thank you very much sir for being with us and uh, we convey our heartfelt gratitude for making our day today thank you sir Thank you, sir. You have answered all our questions that were shouted to you. So, indeed, we are honored and feel a light with your presence on this Golden Jubilee occasion. Thank you once again.